In a world where trombone players and musicians want to know the answers to burning questions, top trombone players, even me, are here with Paul the Trombonist Nowell to answer your burning questions. What's up, everyone? So happy to be here with an amazing, talented trombonist, Jeffrey Miller. I've been following Jeffrey, man. I've been following you for since you were a young one. Yeah, I've been following Watching you grow, man. <laughs> no, literally. <laughs> what made you gravitate towards the trombone? Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm from New Orleans, so it was, you know, I feel like I've seen... I feel like you see trombones around there a lot more often than you would see them anywhere else just because it's so part of the culture, the brass band culture and everything like that, uh, at least right now. Um, so I grew up, I didn't really take notice of it. It kind of, I kind of took it for, and you know, for what it was, um, kind of took advantage of the fact that there was music all around growing up. Um, so I actually grew up singing in church and my grandma was my, the women in my family sang a lot. Um, and I kind of sang around the house. I didn't take music lessons or anything like that, but it was just like a, you know, I guess a hobby, but something that I've just picked up. And then randomly my grandmother, my grandparents got me a drum set. And then I taught myself drums by ear. Didn't get lessons for that either. The middle school came around and we had to pick an instrument and obviously I wanted to play drums because I was, I had a drum set already and I thought I was amazing at it and I wasn't. Um, so we had to audition for a drum set. There's a long, long story to how I got the trombone, but, um, that's, it's the story. Um, I had to audition for drums or well, I wanted to audition for a drum set and in middle school, everybody wanted, well, everybody wanted to play drum set. So, um, it was a lot of competition and when they got down to my drum set audition, uh, my teacher asked me to play all of, or name all of the the parts of the drum set, and I didn't know any. Like I said, I didn't have, I didn't have a teacher. I didn't, you know, I just literally made beats by ear, uh, using the kit. And um, so when it got down to naming the different parts of the drum set, I had no idea what I was doing. I called the snare drum the bass drum. You know, I didn't know what, you know, I didn't know what I was talking about. So needless to say, I did not get the role of a I didn't get the, the drum set gig, um, but he put me on snare drum and I wasn't very good at snare drum either for some reason. Like I couldn't do a roll or anything like that. It was, it was sad. So I, he chased me down at the school one day and was like, do you want to play trombone? Because he was a trombone player too, I guess. And, um, we were short on trombone players in the school. So I just was like, okay, I'll ask my grandmother to see if I can, you know, bring a loud instrument home. Um, like the drums wasn't loud enough. Um, and she was like, sure, I don't care. And that's the his that's the story. That's cool, man. Okay, cool. Yeah, so then I started and the rest is history, as they say. So what was the recording that where you heard a trombonist where you're like, you, you heard the potential of what it could sound like and you're like, whoa. I would say it was a couple different ones. I think the very first one would probably be Trombone Shorty Hurricane Season. Mm-hmm. Um that was the first song that I that I heard that I was like that's sick. And plus he was, you know, a hometown hero, so that made the that made it even more alluring, I would say. And then on a on a broader scale, I would say after that, especially when I started getting more into jazz, I would say J.J. Johnson, Blue Trombone, <laughs> part one, I would say is the the one that was like, whoa, like I, I want to be able to do that. Now, as far as the, the equipment that you're playing on these days, kind of like what what's going on with that? Oh, yeah. So I'm playing on a... BAC custom trombone. Um, five. I've never been good with equipment, like numbers and names and all that stuff, but I think this is a 508 bore. 
Um, <laughs> I've never been, I really have never been good with like bore sizes and all that good stuff. But yeah, BAC made this horn custom for me. Shout out to Mike Corrigan and all the BAC folks over there. Um, they, I got this horn before I went to Europe with Winton and uh, and all those good people. I do play Dennis Wick. Um, endorse them. They're cool. We basically play the same equipment. <laughs> you know, see, that's, you know, hey, that's how it goes. If it works, it works, right? If it works, it works, exactly. And plus, like, this is like, I remember the first time I encountered Dennis Wick was with my teacher, the teacher who started me on trombone. He had this beautiful um, gold-plated heritage mouthpiece, Dennis Wick. And I was like, that's a beautiful mouthpiece. Because then I was used to the student model, you know, mm -hmm. regular, whatever. And I saw that. I was like, that is beautiful. I played it. And I was like, this feels amazing. And so since then, I guess Dennis Wick has always been something that stood out in my mind. So when it came time to, you know. So you've tried the classic and the heritage? Have you tried both? So which one do you, you prefer the classic? I prefer the classic. For a while, I was on the heritage one because I had a, I was at Delphio Marsalis' house for one time, and he we were just playing in, in, in Shedden. And uh, he, he had a heritage mouthpiece that he doesn't you didn't use anymore so he just like gave it to me and uh for a while i just loved how it sounded and then i was trying out some different things and i figured out that this was the one that i'm also more comfortable on um so i sort of just switched to this one day and just never went back but heritage and i feel like it's better when I, i'm doing like more classical mm, more people classical. say that yeah i also notice when when it's gold plated it's softer do you notice that Oh my goodness. Yo, that's exactly, I agree completely. It feels so much better. It feels so much better. Gold plate is the way to go for sure. Yeah, it's uh, especially yeah. if those that have like sensitive skin, mm -hmm. I yeah. feel that maybe the gold may help with that. Something yeah. to that. Cause it's like a, it's kind of a spiritual metal, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, we got to talk about something that we can get deep on it too. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree. Gold, gold plate is definitely where it's at. It just feels, it feels really good. I actually have a new one. I got a new one as well. This one's like pretty worn down, but I still use it because, you know, value and all that. But I have a new one and I guess I'm afraid to use it because it feels so good on my lips right now mm. that I don't want to, you know, mess if it If it's up. not broke, don't fix it. Exactly. Exactly. I always wanted to play 100% gold. 100% gold? Ooh. So see what's up with that, right? <laughs> That's player. That's some player stuff. Right there. Maybe one day someone will make that and we can try it out, see how, how it works out for us. Oh, totally. Totally. I'm totally down. Sweet, man. Yeah. So once you find the equipment, it's like, there's really no reason to search, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I'm always, I'm always open um, to, you know, trying different things and seeing how it sounds. But for now, you know, I'm loyal to, you know, good people at Dennis Wick and BAC and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm happy with how things are right now. So. You know, they always say that the mouthpieces are kind of like eyeglass prescriptions. It's like, mm -hmm. once you know it, it's the fit, it's the fit. It's not like you have to fight with it to work. It's almost like an instantaneous relationship when it's the right piece. Right. Exactly. 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 It's like, I remember where and when <laughs> I found out that Dennis Wick gold plated 10 CS classic was the one and uh yeah yeah like you said you know you 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 know that it's the one it's the right fit you know you don't really look back on it performance so you've been in some pretty high pressure <laughs> situations how do you handle that to play with that caliber of musicians in, in a performance setting where there's huge crowds and kind of what mm -hmm. the what kind of like some um gems of wisdom you might have picked up along the way mm -hmm. I uh, I feel like my whenever I do have nerves, uh, when performing, it's usually primarily due to preparedness. Uh, if I if I don't feel like I'm as prepared, like say there's a song that I was supposed to learn, if I'm playing with an artist, a uh, different artist, um, and there were some songs I was supposed to learn and I didn't quite learn them as well as I should have, or I feel like I haven't, or you know anything like that. Then I I feel like I'd be more a lot more nervous about messing up and and all that good stuff. But mm. um, I usually I feel like I'm usually pretty prepared in in a general sense. But um, I feel like that's that's really the only time that 
the nerves really kick in. Um, that's a good point, man. Yeah. So that's that's true. It's like if if you're not prepared, your nerves are gonna be much more accelerated, right? Exactly. You almost want to get to the point where it's like muscle memory is taken over and you're not really even thinking, and then the nerves go way down. Exactly. I don't want to have to think when I'm when I'm on stage, um, with anyone, with my own band, with you know, with different artists that I'm you know playing trombone for. I don't want to have to think at all. Um, especially when the adrenaline takes over, it's like you don't want to. You just want to rely on that, and and obviously the technique and all the practice that's gotten you to where you are. But yeah. So as far as tonguing goes, mm-hmm. is there any particular approach you you take on your horn? I there was a while where I did not know the answer to this, um, but then I realized that I just doodle tongue, and I sort of go with the natural. Um, turn, turns of the horn and, and the natural placements of the horn. Um, at least, you know, I guess natural for me. I don't know. But um, I don't really, uh, yeah, I would just say doodle tongue is like my, is my go-to. Um, I definitely have to work on my single tongue, though. It's just full disclosure. I definitely have to work on that a lot more. Um, so when you say doodle, though, because yeah. everyone has a different interpretation of that. Yours is is what? It's like I mean, mm. yeah. Mm. That's that's more or less my my tongue style, I guess. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that that's mine. Cool. Now, for maybe some of the the younger trombone players that are listening, what advice would you have for them as far as really getting them to their desired situation. So they have a current situation where they're kind of frustrated, but they really want to get it together. And their desired situation is they want to be at that level, right? Where people are like, all right, they're playing. What type of approach, what advice would you give to them to get to that desired situation? I would say... I mean, I definitely feel like it, it definitely starts with the, the playing level. Because um, I was going to say, you know, I was going to ask, do you mean playing-wise or career-wise? But, I, I mean, it all comes down to it. Let's just say ability on the horn, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I think, at least in this, um, in the more improvisatory styles of music that we're playing on trombone, I feel like it's, I like to to stress the the ear, like working on the ear, because um, if you can hear if you can hear where you know your mistakes are, then I feel like that's the first step in in, in fixing it. Mm. Um, and also, you know, working on your musical ear as well, just like working on you know hearing the things that you that you learning how to play the things that you hear in your head, um, just connecting connecting your mind and the horn as well as you know your soul and your mind and the horn together mm-hmm. that's like the perfect thing where when whatever you you want to play you can just play it that's the that's the goal like that's that's what we're all trying to trying to get to i feel like um just connecting those three is um is definitely something that that should be the goal at least for me um but to start though i think working on I mean, keeping the fundamentals in check are definitely something that my teachers still, you know, instill in me. Like, my first three years at Juilliard, Steve Teray was like, scales, <laughs> that's all we're going to do. I mean, we went over a lot of other stuff, too, but, you know, scales were like the first and sometimes even the last thing that we went over for the for the lessons. Um, and so that's something that, that's kind of been instilled in me is just fundamentals are really important to just... Um, to really not obsess over, but definitely take it more seriously than just, okay, let me just do this quick little long tone warm up or these quick little articulation exercises or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but really getting inside of those and, you know, cause that's what, that's what you're going to rely on when the adrenaline, you know, mm-hmm. falls or whatever you want to mm-hmm. call it. Mm-hmm. Um, but to take it to that next level, I feel like it's, It's it's. I feel like it's about the ear. It's about listening. Um, 
listening to the players that you want to emulate. But obviously you want to, you know, put your own self in there. You want to put your own style, your own sound in there, of course. But um, listening to, like I said, the people you want to emulate, the people that you respect musically. Um, and then working on your own ear as well through that. I feel like I can really take you to the, to the next level. Because I feel like that's what happened with me. Where I was like, I was in high school and I was at my... I was at my, my arts conservatory in high school and I was, you know, playing, we were learning these, these licks and these, you know, transposing these, um, um, yeah, these licks and, and these phrases and, and two five ones and all that good stuff. And I was just like, after, uh, for a little bit, I was just felt like a robot and I was like, okay, what am I really doing this for? Like, what is, what's the, really the goal? And, you know, it's to make music it's to really say something. Right. So, mm. um, there was a, a period of like a few weeks, I think, or maybe a month or two. And I was just really focused on like getting deeper into the music that we were working on um, in school. And I think that's, it was like obsessive, like amount of focus where I was just like, I've got to get inside of this. Like whatever this is, I have to hear, I have to hear this deeper in a, at a deeper level. And really focus on, you know, what the masters were getting to. Like what, you know, people like Freddie Hubbard. And I was really obsessed with Freddie Hubbard at the time also. And, and like people like Clifford Brown and, you know, guys like that. And obviously trombone players as well. Um, mm -hmm. J.J. Curtis and, you know, I was getting into Vincent Gardner a lot at the time too. Nice. Um, so just getting inside of like working on my ear and just really trying to listen at a deeper, deeper, deeper level. Um, and spending time with the music too is something that really helped me. And then after a while, I was able to hear things better. Like I was able to pick up phrases better. Um, I was able to, you know, all that good stuff. I was able to to actually have things to say with my solos and everything like that. Mm. Um, and the only reason I was able to 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 realize that that's what was happening is because other people, like my peers around me, would be like, "Whoa, like." I didn't know you could play like that or I didn't know, like I didn't expect you to, you know, to play that or wow, you're sounding really good. You're sounding really great lately. You know what I mean? Things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and not, not that you should, you know, strive for other people's approval necessarily, but it's, you know, that's what made me realize, okay, something's changing. You know, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting to something with this, this focus, um, and this intense listening. Now, as far as your composition, you're a composer. I, I've heard a lot of your pieces. Beautiful, man. And what's your process of of that? Do you sing a melody? Do you play it on trombone? How's it come to you? Um, I mean, like you, you know, it usually depends. Obviously, um, usually melody comes first for me. Um, I usually just hear a melody in my head, or I'm singing something, or I'm working at. The, I'm just at the piano. I'm just at the piano playing chords sometimes, but mostly, mostly it's just melody just comes to me. And then the chords are kind of like, I kind of hear the chords along with the melody, but sometimes it, I have to just sit down and really hear, okay, what am I really hearing with these chords? Um, but usually the melody comes first, I would say. So you were learning keys the whole time alongside your bone playing? Um, Not the whole time. Um, I think maybe... Sophomore, sophomore year of high school is when mm. I started. Um, at least that's when we took piano class. In gotcha. High school, and then I sort of just took it from there and just tried to get deeper into it a little bit. You have a few albums that, you, it's a couple at this point, right? Uh, one album, I guess you can call it, yeah. One one live album. And then I just have like one single out after that, before that's that. That's it. Yeah. Nice. That was it. Uh, yeah. The live one is it Dizzy's, right? Yeah, yeah. Songs about women. Lies at lies. That's that's great, man. I a lot of your compositions. Yeah, most all of them are, are originals. Um just cause I didn't really wanna deal with, you know, licensing or whatever you want to <laughs> um, clearing. I didn't wanna really deal with deal with all that. I just wanted to put out the music. Mm -hmm. And um yeah, people people have been loving it. Especially um the song I wrote for my sister called Justice. People really like that one. Yeah, that's amazing, man. And the one for your mother, too. 
Yeah, yeah. The one and I saw that video that you have too that you put up that on yeah, yeah. Uh, Juilliard, right? Yeah, yeah. We I just linked with this uh, photographer, videographer Kenneth B. Edwards, and um, he came to my. I had a live. I went to. Um, I had a show at Dizzy's. A week at Dizzy's, they give us like the late night session, and I sort of like um, was experimenting with the music, um, and sort of showcasing it, I guess, workshopping it. I guess with with the late night audience for the week, and he came to the to the show toward the end of the week and loved the love Marie, so he wanted to shoot like a a video for it or just mm. to link up and collaborate. And I was like, okay, yeah, let's just hit up, you know, let's go to Juilliard and film in one of the dance studios or whatever. So we just did that, and I was sitting on that video for a while, for a long time. Um, just wasn't sure when to put it out, and then you know time came to put out the the live album and i was like this is perfect we already have a visual for one of the songs mm -hmm. um let's just put it out with the album do you think there's room for evolution where we still haven't experienced the full capability of the instrument yet mm. that's a good point that's a good question i should say um um that's a good question i didn't even think about it like, what more can it do, right? <laughs> right. I mean. But you know it's going to happen. <laughs> just, yeah, that's the thing. I, I mean, no matter what I say, there's always going to be something. comes along and you're just like, okay, well. All right. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't think I don't think that there's any limit to, to, you know, what can be done, especially when, you know, you know, different different energy and different different energies and different souls are brought into the world you know mm. it's like i feel like that has a lot to do with what mm. comes out you know at least on this plane of existence like you know that's like a good that's, point man you know so i think it there's i don't think there's any possible there's no there's no restrictions there's no limit to what can be done so true because everyone is unique and everyone has their own energy they bring to it mm -hmm. and that will never end for the rest of as long as this world's around. Exactly. It's like, you, yeah. know, you know, we all have different influences that, you know, and experiences that we bring to, to the, to the instrument that is going to, you know, is going to keep going. Yeah. I was always fascinated. Like what about the time periods where they didn't have recordings yet? Like we're talking like before 1860 yeah. or whoever it was. Right. Like, what did that Who existed that was like a, a badass, right? Exactly. Like, <laughs> how do, it's like we don't even know. Yeah, that's a yeah. I agree. You never, you never, you just, you just don't know. It kind of shows you that there's like people in history that you know, even probably back when there was recordings, that just never got a chance to record themselves. And they've been kind of lost, unfortunately, in history. And they could have been a voice. They could have been studied, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because you have all these cats right now who are just like we we may know them personally, and they're you know they maybe they post a little bit on social media, but it's like they're more or less just like ducked off, like in the on the sidelines, just like laying low, like very low key. But we may know them as just like the most ridiculous, like, but they're not in the conversation for some reason. There are so many of those cats around the world, which is, I feel like what makes this, not only this instrument, but this music just so amazing. Just music in general is just like so beautiful in that way. Yeah, imagine life without the music, man. That'd be a depressing place. Yeah. I literally can't imagine life without music and also can't, I can't, I don't think I'll be able to understand people who just don't like music. I mean, I, that sounds like a crazy thing. But <laughs> I've, I've heard of people who are like, no, you know, I'm good. Like, I don't really need music. Like, I'm good. Like, I don't really like it. Like, I've met people like that. And I'm just like, are you okay? Like, do you want to talk about it? Like, I don't know. Like, it's, Yeah, it's... Uh... It's crazy to me. But, yeah, music is... It would be a really boring place without it, for sure. Totally. And you've, you've uh, been on some cuts with... Uh... John Legend, right? Yeah, yeah, I was on. His Tell album, me about that Christmas album. Yeah, I was. Um, I went to L.A. one summer, like I think it was two years ago, or however long it was, um, 
I was just there. I literally wasn't wasn't there to play. I literally was there vacation. Just I just graduated, um, and I was like, okay, let me let me just. I just graduated from undergrad rather mm. uh, at Juilliard, and I was like, okay, let me just go to LA. I treat myself like I deserve this, like to hang out with my friends because at the at that point, my my manager slash best friend he's from there and he was he was living out there he he's from there so he was there and as well as my other good friends they were out there so i was like let me just go catch a vibe i'm gonna bring my horn just in case because you never know and um so i just went vacation hang out um no work scheduled at all and my friend my other good friend who was from new orleans he was living out he's lived lives in la and he's like a producer for producer slash musical director for for Rafael Sadiq and John Legend and people like that. Um, and I just hit him up like, yo, you know, it'd be good to see you while I'm out here. Just, you know, connect. And he knew I was out here. So he was like, yo, just come to come to the studio, um, to Rafael Sadiq's studio. And I was like, OK, yeah, I'll just hang out. And they were working on his album at the time, John Legend's album at the time. And um I brought my home with me because he told me to. I was going to bring it anyway because you never know. And um, he just told me, he was like, yo, just lay down some stuff on this, you know, see what you, see what you come up with. And uh, I was like, okay, sure. And uh, I did. And he told me to take a solo. And I was like, all right, I'll take a solo. And then at that point, Rafael Sadika walked in. And uh, I had taken a few takes of the solo. But I think it might have been the first take. It might have also been the second take. Who knows? But um, I I took the solos, and that was on the Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, which Esperanza, Esperanza Spaulding ended up being featured on. Nice. Um, so Rafael Sadiq heard it. We were all in the, in the, in the, the listening room just listening to it, or the control room, whatever you want to call it. And... Um, yeah, they loved it. They loved it. John Legend wasn't there, but um, he heard it eventually, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you know, the whole thing was, you know, when was the last time? The whole question was, when was the last time you heard a trombone solo on a pop record or anything hey. like that? Um, and so I think, and that was like the main reason or the main question that they used to, I guess, sort of fight for me or fight for the solo being on the on the final cut. Um, which I'm thankful that they did because you know that's history, me. man. That's amazing. That'll be played forever. Yeah, I mean, hopefully the check still keep going. No, I'm joking. Yeah, but, of course. Um, <laughs> that's a good um, lesson too, man. Always have your horn with you. The, oh, <laughs> that's just like that's that has to be you know that has to be like on the Ten Commandments of being a musician. It's like always be ready, mm -hmm. um, especially horn players. Always have your horn with you because you literally never know. Um, especially when you're going to musical situations like a studio or something, you know, you just never know. Um, but yeah, they ended up fighting for me and I guess John loved it too. Even though in the music video, the, in the music video, the kid is playing a, like a toy trumpet instead of a trombone. I was kind of salty. They never get that right, man. I know. They always think it's a trumpet. I'm like, no, it's not at all. But I've seen movies before. There's literally a trumpet playing and then the video is a sax player. <laughs> They yeah they just don't care I guess at that point they're like it's musical it's an instrument, um, but yeah they uh they ended up using my my solo on there and and uh, I have a a little mini solo, the whole the whole album is pretty much like New Orleans theme throughout, um, they use a lot of my friends who um, who are down in New Orleans a lot of them recorded for the album as well, mm -hmm. um. And yeah, I was lucky enough to get uh, a bigger, a big solo on that, on that, uh, on that song, and a little bit of a, like a solo on the other, on another song. I forget which one, but um, yeah. And then that allowed me to to play on the voice with him when he was about to be announced as a new judge for the voice. Oh, cool, man. Um, yeah, they they wanted to feature him, and his album had just come out, so um, I got a call like, hey can you, you know, it'd be cool to, to actually use, you know, the guy who soloed on the, on the album for the show, for the, the performance. And I was like, I, I had no, 
intention of, of going out to LA, it was kind of like, a, okay, let me just do this. Like, you know, let me just get out there, um, as, as easily as I can. Um, and so I, I booked the flight, went out to LA, did the show and, uh, my manager was out there. He helped me document it and, um, uh, it was a good time. And then That's awesome, man. I told all my friends and family about it and they went crazy. They were really excited and I actually met John. So it was cool to actually meet him in person, to actually speak to him. Um, I actually met him like back in the day in like fifth grade or so wow. or something like that. I don't even, um, but he, he wouldn't have remembered and I barely remembered. And then I met him at the voice and he was really, really cool. Um, he was chill. He was super chill. And Esperanza was really nice. And yeah. The all-stars, it was, it was, man. It was, it was <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a really good time. It was really fun. And uh, yeah, and then it got, the album got nominated for a Grammy. So Sweet. That, uh, you know. Man, all from being prepared and having your horn with you. Exactly. You never know where it leads. Amazing. Exactly. Exactly. So, That's a great lesson. Thank God for that. Yeah. So I also... I don't know where I, I saw this, but uh, you have a historic relative that played with Buddy Bolden, right? Tell me about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, so his name is Papa John Joseph. No relation to the pizza company. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, he was a bass player, uh, played at Preservation Hall regularly, um, and he, the way that he died was that he was they were playing a really rousing rendition of when the saints go marching in. And then at the, end of the, at the end of the song, oh, so ironically, he, you know, he, he checked out. He died. It's a good way to go, but rest in peace. Right. right exactly. I'm good like, way to go. If you're going to go out, that's a good way. Exactly. I'm like, that, that's <laughs> how I want to go out. If I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to do this all my life, that's exactly how I want to go. Mm -hmm. Um, if I, you know, obviously we don't necessarily get the choice. Um, uh, but, yeah, that's, I was like, wow, that's crazy because it, it was even crazier because I ended up being in the Preservation Hall Junior Jazz Band mm -hmm. when I was, in, when I was in uh, high school or even in middle school, I guess. Um, we were sort of like spent every Saturday at the, at Preservation Hall, just learning from, um, learning from them. And, uh, it was kind of like, a. Yeah, it was like a it was like a program, I guess you could call it, but it was um, it was only a few of us, and um, literally went to Preservation Hall every Saturday, um, and learn learn tunes and you know learn traditional New Orleans tunes, mm -hmm. and um, just just learned a lot. And eventually, I was fifteen, uh, twenty twelve. They took us to to Carnegie Hall because they had a their fiftieth anniversary performance and. Uh, they featured us and brought us out um, for a couple tunes, including the last one, the finale. And that was a big one because Trumbo Shorty was there, Most Def was there. Wow. Yellow Jackets, um, just a bunch of a bunch of people, and it was a it was a it was a lot of fun. I think Bonnie Ray was there. I don't know, but um, it was a lot of people. It was a lot of fun, and it was my first time in New York, so I was like, this is so cool. Um, so. You know, it's just ironic that I, you know, ended up playing with Preservation Hall when my my relative was was playing at Preservation Hall. You know what I mean? It just that's full circle. It's amazing. Full circle. Yeah. I yeah. Was, I was super super amazed by that. And I was always fascinated, like, what did Buddy Bolden sound like? Right? Did Did you ever get a chance to talk to anyone that actually heard him? <laughs> no, I didn't. But I I I have been meaning to go back and, and ask my people at Preservation Hall if they could find any records of of uh of my relative Papa John Joseph mm. and see if you know what what they could find on him. Yeah. Because I know I know that they have some they have like a whole bunch of stuff in the archives and, and I'm sure that they can find something. Um so I've been meaning to, to go back and ask about that. So I'm I'm when I when I know you'll know That's fascinating, you know. It's fascinating what Buddy Bolden accomplished. Yeah. The fact that he, I mean, he was probably the one of the most, or if the most, contributing factor to the music that we play, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, he, you know, allegedly had this this sound that was just so, especially 
considering the time that he was in. It's like he just took the music and just flipped it upside down, but it was still something that people wanted to hear. Like, they didn't know that they wanted to hear it until they heard it type thing. Like, they didn't know it could be done until he did it. Fascinating. And it's fascinating that he accomplished that. He's a historical figure, but yet there's no evidence of his playing. <laughs> it's, spooky. it's spooky, man. It's like, it's almost, I don't know, it's something almost celestial about it, I guess, if you want to look at it that it's way. It's like a mythological figure, right? Exactly. It's like the myth of Buddy Bolden or whatever you want. I mean, he was obviously a real person because there's, you know, there there are documents and, and there's documentation about his being, you know, a person. But in terms of musical documentation and recordings and stuff like that, it's like, if only, if we had that missing piece, it'd be, I wonder what the music would look like today if we had that. For sure. Had that, that footage. But there was probably an element of, through osmosis, the musicians playing with them, like your relative, that kind of carried the torch from what he kind of created, right? Mm -hmm. And we right. kind of hear it, hear it through other people. Exactly. And that's the yeah. beauty of it, too, is that, you know, we all affect each other, um, if not over and definitely subconsciously in some kind of way, because we all take we all take our experiences um, and put it into the music that we make individually. And, you know, our experiences are formed by other people. And so indirectly, we take other people inform us whether we realize it or not, which is so fire to me. It's so yeah. to me. Yeah. No, it's a it's otherworldly, man. The, just the whole concept of music and yeah. people's voices and the energy and it you, words can't even describe it. It's just yeah. uh, it's from another world, man. Yeah, I, that's why I always say that. You know, I'm just blessed to you know. Not even just me. Like we're blessed to to as musicians to have this ability to create something like this, because music is gonna be here forever. Like literally music music is in everything so it's going to exist forever and so it's it's a beautiful thing that we we possess the ability to create using music that's uh, it's true and it's been here since humans have existed right mm -hmm. and if you think about all the most important aspects of life ceremonies religion everything that's the most important what is the central element that's that's in the the nucleus of those events <laughs> it's the music it's the music, it's the music. It, it sets it it puts it on a different frequency literally yeah um yeah it just makes the sets the tone for the event no pun intended yeah it's crazy bro i think about it a lot especially when i'm i'm, I'm fairly religious um, so I, I pray a lot and I just think, I think about it all the time, just like how lucky I am to be, you know, to have some kind of gift in this, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And obviously we're all, you know, all trying to, we're striving to be better every day at what we do, but to have some kind of gift initially is, is a blessing for sure. Hmm. Not for real. So what's on the horizon next for you? What are you working on? Um, right now, I'm primarily focused on uh, some more some more artist stuff. Working on recording a lot of new music. Um, this time, singing a lot. Um, the first single I put out in 2018 was called "Lose Control," and it's, I sing in that song. And uh, I wrote it and produced it and and all that good stuff, along with a good friend of mine who helped me with like the electronic production on it, but. Um, more or less produce the musical aspects of it. Um, or so I I'm singing on that song. So it's but it's going to be a lot different. I was sort of like experimenting with lose control just to figure out what I wanted to sound like. Mm -hmm. But that was two years ago, and since then, I've tapped in with a good producer friend of mine who I met through my manager who went to NYU. Um, so they're both NYU grads, and since meeting with my producer Ben. Um, I feel like we've been able to hone in on a sound that's really unique, but can also, you know, be, I'm not, I don't want to say marketable, but it's like, it's appeal, it's, it's appeal is pretty, can be pretty wide. 
You know, mm. What I mean? mm. at least on the it's more like the the R and B jazz pop realm, but it's, nice. it incorporates trombone just like immensely. Just I feel like that's something that's been missing. It's like actual instrumental, like you know, application in music, and so the new sound is definitely more vocal driven, but it incorporates trombone. Like you sing on this? Yeah, yeah. Cool. A lot of vocals. Um, but yeah, it's cor- incorporating trombone and like a lot, like crazy. Like it's a vibe. For sure. Looking it's forward to it, man. Vibe. If not, by the end of this year, have one song out and then, um, and then just keep it going that way. Nice. So, that's the goal. And then putting, putting music on, putting horns on other people's projects too. Mm. Yeah. I, Sweet. Uh, yeah. I put, I had a, I have a little trombone moment on uh, this, this guy named Baby Jake. He's a, he's a rapper, singer. He does, a, he does a lot. He has a, he's a pretty versatile artist. He signed to Square Braun mm. uh, through Republic. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, just you know got connected with him and uh yeah i have a solo on his on his new project that dropped or his new nice. song called head in the clouds i'll check that out yeah it's a good one sweet so it's, man it's on, it's on like the outro post interlude kind of thing but yeah it's a vibe so yeah putting horns on other people's projects too is fun nice man uh, yeah it's a good time well i could talk to you forever man yeah bro yeah, it's, it's, it's good. Next time when we're in person, like we'll, we'll jam and uh, oh yeah, put bro. up some content yeah. like that. Definitely, I have my horn ready too. I was excited, but this is also fun. I love, I love talking. I mean, I'm from New Orleans, so you know, social, social vibes. I'm like an yeah. introvert, introvert when I need to be. So where can everyone find you, man? Um, I'm on Instagram at the Jeffrey Miller, T H E J E F F E R Y. People, a lot of people mix up the E and the R. So it's E R Y, not R U Y. Um, so the Jeffrey Miller on Instagram, Facebook is Jeffrey Miller. Um, just got verified on both, so Sweet. it should be easy to find. Um, Twitter's not verified, but it's I'm Jeffrey Miller. Uh, I am I, the letter I, the letter M, Jeffrey Miller. Um, yeah, those are the main three that I use. What about your YouTube channel? You got one of those, right? I do have a YouTube. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I guess, Jeffrey Miller. You can Google Jeffrey Miller trombone. I'll put the links down below. And everyone go follow Jeffrey, man. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate it. Yeah, that. check out what he's doing. He's doing great. Amazing. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. Dude. Awesome, man. It's good to do this. To do this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, do you want to play? Uh, I don't know. Should my game be turned down a little bit? Turn your game down. Do a little solo. We'd love it. Or I could just let them check out the music and they can hear it for themselves. <laughs> Ooh, no. I'll play a little bit. <laughs> Come on, man. I haven't played today, so just forgive me if it sounds not as good as you wanted to. Beautiful, man. So, there's that. You keep evolving. Every time I hear you, you get better and better. Oh, thank you, man. I'm trying. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Beautiful. Wishing you the best, man. I got you, man. Stay safe. Yeah, you too, man.